Hi, Madeline, and hi, Betsy. It's such a pleasure to be here with both of you. I have admired both of your work um, for a long time. And I thought before we launched into conversation, we could just hear a little bit from each of you, um, just a, a, a brief reading so we can get kind of grounded in each of these books before we talk about how they're doing what they're doing in such exciting and urgent and necessary ways. So, um, I don't know, uh, Madeline, would you mind getting us started? Yeah, okay. Uh, so I am, I am indeed uh, talking from the middle of the night in Berlin. So I do apologize if I'm not quite as cogent as I would otherwise be. Um, so I am only accidentally in Berlin. Um, but I'm gonna read from the beginning of my novel, which is set in Sydney, Australia. And that's really all you need to know. I couldn't sleep at night. The heat rose in the evenings, the old bricks of the house absorbed it, and after dark, my bedroom felt as thick and quivering as an oven. Open windows didn't help. On the seven o'clock news, there was always somebody making a show of frying an egg on the asphalt of an outer suburb's driveway. Watch this, they would shout to the camera. Yokes slipped out onto the bitumen and sat trembling there beneath the burning Australian sun. The people on the news were always grinning, nearly naked but for a singlet or a pair of shorts, sweating into their sunglasses. Nobody ever ate the egg. By the time the fireworks had blown up over the harbour and the city was wasted and the new year begun, I had handed in my final papers and my academic life was behind me. The open wilderness of adulthood stretched ahead like so much wasteland. During the sleepless days of that last hot summer, I had no money and nothing to do, but the bus that left from Cleveland Street could get me to the beach in half an hour. The air along the coast in those months was full of seaweed and car exhaust and the fires that were burning on the edge of the city. Rounding the cliffs, I could walk through the parklands and along the ocean path to the secluded rocks and boat racks of Gordon's Bay. I passed weeks there, stretched out in a towel, reading novels and jumping into the deep water when the heat became unbearable. In the end, they would say that this January was the hottest month on record, in the hottest year on record, although they've said that about every year since. But this was the last January I sweltered through before I left the city entirely. I don't know anything about those other summers. The heat wave broke with a storm. The squall bore down from the Pacific, sweeping subtly winds across the city and snatching frangipani flowers from their branches. The convulsion of the storm struck me in a way that struck in a way that seemed only natural, following as it did the tense weeks that seemed to justify the punch to the back of the head, the child left locked in the back seat of the car, the missing girl. The morning after the storm arrived, I lay on the rocks beside the bay, and at last I was able to sleep. When I woke up, I was overheated, my body covered in sweat. I picked away down the rocks and surveyed the brown storm surge mucking up the edges of the water. I took a leap. The day was still, the rocks deserted, the splash could be heard all over the bay. I dived deep under the storm surge and closed my eyes and began to swim out. When I'd gone far enough into the depths, I turned and looked back to where I'd been. From above, the palms in Bougainvillea erupted in great green and pink swarms from the cliff face like some madman's garden of Babylon. Seagulls circled overhead. I floated in the clear water in the middle of the bay and thought that I wouldn't be so afraid to be lost at sea. The smooth blue expanse couldn't hurt me, not the one I imagined stretching out for miles and miles, all the way east to Valparaiso, north to California, the tips of Alaska and Russia and Japan, eternities away from here. The sun beat down, I treaded water and spread out my arms, and I observed just then, as though waking not out of, but into a nightmare, a long yellow and black thing swimming in the water. The sun glinted on its scales and it took me a moment to see it for what it actually was. I had never seen one in the wild. When I was a child, my mother had told me how deadly they could be. She had seen them coiled on the seabed in the north of the country and washed up on the beaches of the remote Pacific islands she had visited with my father when they were happy together. That sea snakes rarely struck didn't make them any less threatening. If they bit you, the neurotoxic venom would begin to work through your limbs before you could make it to shore. Blurred vision, numb throat, a prickle in the soles of the feet, and then a burst of pain in every cell of your body, like a fire sweeping through the nervous system and destroying everything in its path. I looked at the water, flat and silent all around me. I had swum out too far. The bay was empty. I knew that it was the most vulnerable parts of the body one needed to guard. They bit you in the thin, fleshy spaces between your fingers and your toes. I drew my hands into fists. I kicked with my toes clenched. I swam towards the rocks, moving through the water as though I were punching it. The snake had been carried into shore overnight, swept along with, from warmer depths by the storm. The snake was weak, but weak things lash out. Its body rose and fell with the lap of the tide and it moved with its mouth open. Thank you. So lovely to hear that. 
Um, Betsy, would you mind reading a little bit as well? Sure. I, I'm also going to read from the beginning of the book, but not the very beginning. So just know that we are uh, have taken a trip along a, to an electrified portion of um, the Chicago River. How's that? That man should have dominion over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth is a prophecy that is hardened into fact. Choose just about any metric you want, and it tells the same story. People have by now directly transformed more than half the ice-free land on earth, some 27 7 million square miles, and indirectly half of what remains. We have dammed or diverted most of the world's major rivers. Our fertilizer plants and legume crops fix more nitrogen than all terrestrial ecosystems combined, and our planes, cars, and power stations emit about 100 times more carbon dioxide than volcanoes do. We now routinely cause earthquakes. A particularly damaging human-induced quake that shook Pawnee, Oklahoma on the morning of September 3rd, 2016, was felt all the way in Des Moines. In terms of sheer biomass, the numbers are stark staring. Today, people outweigh wild mammals by a ratio of more than eight to one. Add in the weight of our domesticated animals, mostly cows and pigs, and that ratio climbs to 22 to one. In fact, as a recent paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences observed, humans and livestock outweigh all vertebrates combined with the exception of fish. We have become the major drivers of extinction and also probably of speciation. So pervasive is man's impact, it is said we live in a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. In the age of man, there is nowhere to go, and this includes the deepest trenches of the oceans and the middle of the Antarctic ice sheet that does not already bear our Friday-like footprints. An obvious lesson to draw from this turn of events is be careful what you wish for. Atmospheric warming, ocean warming, ocean acidification, sea level rise, deglaciation, desertification, eutrophication, these are just some of the byproducts of our species success, such as the pace of what is blandly labeled global change, that there are only a handful of comparable examples in Earth's history, the most recent being the asteroid impact that ended the reign of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. Humans are producing no analog climates, no analog ecosystems, a whole no analog future. At this point, it might be prudent to scale back our commitments and reduce our impacts but there are so many of us, as of this writing, nearly 8 billion, and we are stepped in so far, return seems impracticable. And so we face a no analog predicament. If there is to be an answer to the problem of control, it's going to be more control. Only now it's got to be managed, is not a nature that exists or is imagined to exist apart from the human. Instead, the new effort begins with the planet remade and spirals back on itself. Not so much the control of nature, as the control of the control of nature. First you reverse a river, then you electrify it. Thank you so much. Um, it's really, you know, hearing um, both of these books I love and I'm so excited to get to ask you um, both together questions about them tonight. And it's interesting to hear those two beginnings out loud because um, the, the both, both of these narratives, even if they're working in very different ways, Madeline's book is a novel and Betsy, your book is, is narrative journalism and research-based and nonfiction, not fiction, but they, they both actually begin with um, animals in the water where they don't belong in some way, whether it's a, a, um, a snake in the ocean or the Asian carp um, in, the, um, in the river. And um, one of the things that I wanna talk about is sort of how to use these um, tangible, sort of smaller scale details and set pieces to kind of bring us into crises of kind of unimaginable scale. Um, and so I think it's kind of wonderful to get grounded in where each book opens up and how each one opens up. And I wanted to start by by putting a question to both of you and, and, and we're gonna talk for a while and I would just encourage everybody who's here, I know there are a lot of people here tonight to just put your, your own questions in the Q&A at any point and um, I'll be, turning to, to them to make sure that we have plenty of time because I know people have probably a lot of things that they're curious about and so we'll be tracking that and and just start putting them in at any point. Um, but I wanted to open with a question really just to get us started thinking and talking about 
the difficulties of writing about climate change. And, and I wanted to read a brief quote from Amitav Ghosh's book, The Great Derangement, which I, I know is important to, to you, Madeline, as you were writing. And I imagine you're familiar with as well, Betsy, but um, he's, he's talking about the, or the, that book is talking about the, um, the, the ways in which the novel isn't um, suited to, to climate change um, because it's, quote, essence consists of phenomena that were long ago expelled from the territory of the novel, forces of unthinkable magnitude that create unbearably intimate connections over vast gaps in time and space. And really where I wanted to begin was by asking both of you, how do you think about finding forms of storytelling that can bring us into reckoning with these forces of unthinkable magnitude? If climate crisis is something that exists kind of beyond the human scale, how do you find human scale stories to tell about it that, that start to open it up or make it visible? You should go first. <laughs> you want me to take that one? Okay. Uh, I, I mean, that's a question that, you know, preoccupies journalists, obviously, you know, anyone who writes about climate change, how do you tell this story that's sort of everywhere and everything all at once? You know, it's not, it's not a story, you know, um, there's a sort of phrase in journalism, you know, and it applies to many different, you can apply to many different issues, but you know, that's an issue not a story. And in cli with climate change, that problem, as it were, is, is, is writ large, you know, and, and it, it's always sort of, you know, it will always be with us. It, it's not changing, it's not, well, it is changing, unfortunately, but it's not, it's not going anywhere. So, so um, you could say, you know, it's every story, but that is not really a solution. So, you know, what do what do I do? Well, I've, you know, tried every trick in the journalist, you know, handbook. Um, I've written profiles of people. I've gone to places. I've spent a lot of time um, in the Arctic in my, over the last 15 years or so, because the Arctic is a place where the impacts of climate change are more, very visible, more visible, or certainly were more visible when I began this, you know, trek. Um, so that, you know, going places, uh, talking to people who are affected, you know, we're, you know, we can be at the edge of Southern Louisiana, watching the sea level, you know, seas reclaim the land, you know, so, um, trying to find a, a story and sometimes trying to do, you know, what I think Madeline does so, so brilliantly really is, well, this isn't necessarily a climate change story, but climate change works its way through it, you know? So I, I've done, these are all, there's no right answer to that question, but the challenge of it, um, this phenomenon caused by humans, but as, as you said, Leslie, very inhuman in its scale um, is a big challenge. And it really, I think has challenged both journalists and fiction writers um, because of that. Yeah, I agree. It's really, it's hard to tell a story in the way that we're taught to tell stories. Um, you're taught to sort of start from the one individual from a micro level, from the level of like a family. Um, it's, and you don't get the whole scope of climate change from one individual or one family. Um, and that was, I, I, so I read um, The Great Derangement by Amitav Ghosh when I was about halfway through writing my novel. And at that point, my novel was, I thought it was about something else, but I kept writing about nature. I kept being, um, I was incredibly anxious about nature. I kept like obsessively sort of reading stories about sea snakes um, and, and everything else. And it felt, um, it felt relevant and I didn't know how. And he, reading that book made me uh, reevaluate what I was doing. Um, so the like the the novel that I've written, um, much to much to some consternation, does not have much of a plot. Um, it's the story of one person who just sort of has a bad year. Um, but she doesn't. What I was sort of interested in doing was trying to use her as a kind of example in a sometimes as a sort of like a reporter's eye. She's able to talk about other things and bring in other stories um, because she's a writer. Um, 
but I was interested in just the like the kind of everyday experience of climate change for most of us, which is if we're not able to go to the Arctic and if we're not going to Louisiana or we're not talking to people who are sort of on the front lines of it, it's mostly just through information that we get. I mean, it's through this radial anxiety. Um, and the moments that we actually encounter it are like, like the last few weeks when there's just an inordinate amount of snow and you know it's not right. Or you run into an animal where you're not, you, you know it's not normal to run into that kind of animal. And there are these moments, I guess, of the uncanny um, but our lives sort of increasingly have become uncanny. Um, I think especially like I, um, I'm in my early thirties and I think anyone who has about like, who's about my age, we've lived through climate change being something we were told as a kid, as kids would like existed and was going to get sorted out soon. And now, uh, <laughs> And it, it's just like, it shows you that, yeah. Yeah, it's just been this increasing amount of anxiety to the point, like, you know, I, I went to the Great Barrier Reef um, when I was a kid and it was um, interesting to, in um, Betsy in your book to read about the Great Barrier Reef because it's really not, do it, like it's it's gone or it's, it's going. Um, and when I was a kid, I was, you know, was told like it was gonna be there forever. So I think, I mean, to some extent, like, I don't want to say it's like a great opportunity for writers that like, it's going to give us all these different structures. Um, but it does, I think, challenge the, this is the greatest, this is the greatest problem facing us as humanity. And I think um, if we're going to make art about it, and we're going to make art about everything. Um, and if we're going to write about it, if we're going to tell one another stories about it. Um, it sort of has to be bigger than than one individual or one family. Um, or at least we, we can try to try to sort of multiply the stories and make it broader. Yeah, I was certainly having the experience as I read both of your books um, in different ways of a kind of simultaneous sense of uh, justifiable and I think completely appropriate um, horror and despair and, and, and some of the range of feelings that I think we all feel when we think about these forces of unthinkable magnitude, but also uh, a kind of um, a craftsman's awe at the, the, the forms of storytelling that both of you were finding and, and, and how actually there's so much emotion. I found there to be so much emotional range in both of your books where it's, it's actually not just that register of uh, futility and despair, but also registers of, um, of innovation, hope, pleasure, sort of um, letting in all of those various tones through the different stories that you're trying to tell. And, and I was thinking, Madeline, as you were speaking about, I, I read um, an essay that you wrote about the process of writing the book where you talk about trying to uh, document um, this, how the slow apocalypse um, becomes part of the fabric of daily life. And, and I think it was beautiful how we could even hear that in the passages that you read aloud, the, the, the eggs. Um, on the sidewalk and the snake in the water and the the um, nights, the heat of the nights, like an oven, that, that kind of creeping texture into daily life. And there's so much texture in both of your books. It, it turns this, it turns the unthinkable into something we can um, taste and feel, which is a, um, a, a great horror and a great gift at once, I think. Um, I wanted to build off of this moment, and I'm so glad that we actually he heard you read this moment, Betsy, because I wanted to ask you both about some of the questions it raises. Uh, I wanted to ask you both about control, and I know Madeline and I were chatting at one point, I know that control was a thread that she was really interested in and in, in connecting both of your books. Um, but there's this moment we heard you read, Betsy, where uh, you talk about uh, you're right, if there's to be an answer to the problem of control, it's going to be more control. And, and part of what your book is documenting is, is these um, interventions that are meant to counteract previous attempts to control nature. Um, but I wanted to ask both of you sort of how you consider your books reckoning with control, with the fantasy of being able to control things, with the futility of control, with coming up against what we can't control, with the damage that trying to control things does. Like how, both of your books are, are about control in really different, I think, but fascinating ways. So I'd love to hear each of you think a little bit about what role control plays in, in these books that you've written and, and how you attempt to get at some of its complexities. 
I, I, do you want to take that one first, Madeline? I, I... <laughs> well, I, uh, I mean, I, control, I think, is like something that is in both of these books, but it's obviously very different. Um, because in the novel, you're sort of in the consciousness of someone who's like in their early 20s, who's like not doing, like, she's just like not having a great time. Um, the, I was really interested in the book in um, sort of doing what you what you were talking about, Leslie, like really intensifying the heat of moments, um, making the environment uh, like an objective correlative to what she was feeling. And I think um, that is certainly my experience of living, uh, living, just being alive uh, for the last like 10 years of my life of um, the environment feeling more and more potent, it, uh, that feeding into my feelings and to just sort of like um, the weather of one's life. Uh, and I think especially in the last year, we're all much more aware of the weather because uh, it's it's um, the one stimulus that we've sort of all got in common. Um, so I was interested in doing that a lot um, to sort of the, the book, um, to the extent that it's got a kind of movement, it just gets more intense. Um, it's structured by environmental catastrophes so or like environmental sort of things so there's um, a heat wave in the beginning then there is a flood there is um, an earthquake which don't happen very much in Australia because it's in the middle of a plate um, but they happen sometimes and um, at the end there is a wildfire um, and it just it builds um, and everything that happens is linked in a particular way with um, how the narrator is sort of experiencing her own sense of, of coming apart, of losing control of her boundaries. Um, there's a lot of stuff about like borders and boundaries being dissolved, um, which I was very interested in thinking about. And um, I was reading a lot of Donna Haraway when I was uh, writing the book. Um, and she talks a lot about that sort of thing. Um, but it, 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 be it becomes sort of, they, it becomes one and the one and the same thing. Um, sorry, I feel like I'm beginning to ramble a little bit because I'm tired. Um, but yeah, the um, it uh, yeah okay. I'm done. When the whole part of the brilliance too of the I think situating the the narrator in this crisis call center that she works in is is that space where she's literally sort of receiving all of these calls from people, strangers, anonymous strangers who are in these situations of, of, of danger and peril that she can't fix, is it actually, it, it turns the, that sense of futility from something sort of abstract and big picture into something playing out moment by moment, literally getting, it's, 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 it's in a way we're like all living through a world in which we're getting these calls about problems that we can't solve, but she is literally in a room getting all these calls about problems she can't solve. So there's a kind of dramatizing of the, a certain lack of control that's playing out and that just the, the level of the narrative there as well. And it, um, Yeah, and there's always this sense of, um, so the, the narrator works in a, basically the equivalent of a 911 call center. Um, she directs the calls, but she ends up having to sort of feel them and listen to them. And she, it means that everything, every time she experiences something through the phones, it is always at the peak of intensity. Um, everyone is having one of the worst days of their lives. Um, they need an ambulance right away. Like someone, some like their mother is dying on the floor or like a fire is coming into the house, like uh, coming up the garden. Um, and she gets neither the beginning of the story nor the end of the story. She just gets like the intensity of that peak, uh, peak middle and it com the calls come from all over the country. So you get, um, so that's sort of like, um, it's a way of, it was, it was a technique of trying to bring in a lot of the stuff about climate change, about how specifically it's impacting Australia because Australia is um, kind of a petri dish uh, of climate change. It is a, um, a, a ringing knell of what's to come. Um, and it, it's, it all comes in in this like building, building wave of intensity that never really like it, you never get, you never get to come off of it and you never really have a sense of, you never really have a sense of narrative because it's a problem with climate change. It's just that, like, that, like, like what Betsy was saying at the beginning, it's, it's a thing that um, it doesn't lend itself well to like the ways of storytelling that we, um, we generally tend to have. And Betsy, I'm curious how you, um, I mean, both how you think about some, uh, whether 
any of those ways of kind of thinking about a reckoning with control resonate. Um, and, you know, um, whether you could speak just a bit to, to how that dilemma, which you articulated so beautifully, even in just what you read to us, but at the kind of there's no analog solution, like there's no way, there's no sort of, um, or even to not intervene as a form of intervention at this point, because, you know, um, at one point you say kind of like you, you break it, you own it, you know, but um, how you think about the sort of the, the competing tensions of control, the, the damage that has been done by, by attempting to control, but then the sort of necessity of trying to act in some way to mitigate that, that, that damage. Well, that, you know, that's definitely the heart of the book is the question of, you know, each chapter takes on, and it's, it's not only climate change, really, the climate change in, in, in my book is just the end of the book, uh, sort of also there's a, you know, as with Madeline's, hopefully a building, you know, um, an arc, um, but it's all sorts of ways that humans have, you know, intervened. Uh, so in the first chapter we get, you know, we intervened to, to reverse the flow of a river. That's something that Chicago did in 1900. And it's a fascinating story uh, in and of itself, uh, an immense construction project, the, the biggest of its day. Um, and then you get, well, that solved one problem that was done to solve Chicago's sewage problems. Um, and then, oh, lo and behold, you know, we didn't reckon with X or Y. Um, so that was one form of control, really monumental when you think about it, you know, to reverse the flow of a river. Uh, and in that particular case, just to use a specific example, the impact of that was to connect the Great Lakes to the Mississippi drainage basin. And that had, you know, unfortunate, let's just put it this way, unfortunate consequences that hadn't really been entirely envisioned or thought through um, that we're now grappling with. and. Um, you know, not to get into the nitty gritty details of the story, but that's what results in then electrifying part of the river. You know, we're trying to, in that case, keep species from each basin from crossing from one to the other. So the real question at the heart of the book, I guess, you know, is, are, you know, are we ever in control of these systems that we're deeply enmeshed with, but that's somewhat different from controlling them. Um, so that's really the, the, the question. Can we take systems that are incredibly complicated, you know, arose through geological or biological history, and even can we even understand them well enough to insert ourselves into them, to do, get them, you know, nudge them, move them in the way that we want to? Um, but it also raises the opposite question, which is, well, we, we, we're we so enmeshed in these systems now, as, as you said, that, you know, to not do anything at this point, to not, uh, is, is, is still to do something. So there are, you know, we're between a proverbial rock and a hard place. And these stories in the book, they're sort of, you know, parables in a way about, um, each one, I hope, has a kind of paradigmatic quality, but there are a gazillions of stories that I could have chosen to illustrate similar points. And, you know, one other point that I'd make when I read Madeline's book that I thought was, was really interesting and an interesting resonance between the two books was, you know, people wanting someone, you know, someone was going to save them. Someone from the call center is going to you know, rescue them. And, um, you know, sometimes that's true. And sometimes, in, you know, in the book, it's, you know, not true. And the, and the narrator is stuck there sort of thinking, you know, what happened after I hung up the phone, which was, I think, is a very good, you know, sort of metaphor for the situation we're, we're in as well. Is, is there an answer here? Is someone, something in my book, it's more sort of more, not a savior but a technology um is something going to save us and that's a big question <laughs> yeah is elon musk's um money gonna save us all um the the and i think one thing that i would be curious to ask both of you about as well which is really building on what you were just um saying betsy is like um how both of these books again in different ways but are sort of confronting that um 
fantasy of fixing or solving, you know, that there is no, that even to talk about fixing the climate crisis is, is a misnomer at this point. That it's like more like maybe a word like mitigation or something like that, but, but that there is this human, this probably this tendency we can't kill ourselves to want to fix things or wouldn't believe in the possibility of salvation. Um, I'm going to, I'm not actually going to turn to some of the, the, there are already so many smart questions and thoughtful questions from people here. And I know there's going to be more and they're, they're really building off of what we've been talking about. So I'm going to turn us to a few of them. Um, and um, I'll, I'll start with um, this, uh, this beautiful question that's, that's really thinking about, uh, actually there are a couple questions here that are thinking about um, despair and how to write, uh, write into and invite readers into a, a, a kind of a dilemma that's filled with such despair. Um, uh, Hannah asks, um, I'm very interested to hear your thoughts about um, what Jenny Awful calls the quote, obligatory note of hope, the tendency for climate writing to end on a hopeful note, a promise that everything will be okay one way or another and or that there is reason for optimism. Is the note of hope a way of inviting the reader to engage by soothing them away from despair or does it in some way obfuscate the magnitude of the issue? Um, does hope cancel out despair or work alongside it? Uh, I Every question is like <laughs> basically taking on the whole universe. You guys are so brave and eloquent. No, I mean, it's funny. Um, so when Jenny Offel's book came out, uh, uh, it was around when uh, my book came out in Australia and I hadn't thought about um, a question of, of despair or about an obligatory note of hope in, um, in quite those terms until I was asked about it. Um, and I had to then reckon with the fact that I, I haven't, it's, my, my book doesn't have one of those. Um, it, it, it ends and that's about it. Um, I don't, I think the obligatory note of despair is the kind of thing that um, it's part and parcel of what the novel, like quote unquote, like big capital letters, uh, it, it's what we expect of the novel. We expect a kind of re resolution. We expect um, some sort of sense of like completion at the end of a novel. That's kind of what we look for from narrative a lot of the time. Um, and a lot of the narratives that I was really inspired by were, um, I was writing, most of what I was reading while I was writing this book was creative nonfiction. I was writing, a, I was reading a lot of nature writing, um, like the sort of bulk of the history of nature writing. I was reading um, a lot of creative nonfiction. Um, I was trying to figure out a way to like get away from that kind of structure. Um, and I think the problem with the obligatory note of hope is it's not necessarily honest. Um, like I, I'm just like, I'm just some woman. I can't tell you that everything's going to be okay. Like I've written a book that I hope is in some way a mirror, um, that in some way is consoling in, um, in the way that it sort of depicts like how, how I feel about the, how I feel the world is or how I feel about like how I feel about any number of things, but um, I don't, I, th I think what I'm, what we're facing and just like the way that we are as humans, it's much more complex than that. Um, and our lives don't have these moments of ending in this way anyway. Like the, the book ends basically because the narrator leaves Australia. Um, and it was just like, it's used as the sort of end point. It goes from year to year. It follows the course of the seasons. Um, and that is the structure of the book and it's sort of a window in on a life, but it, um, it, it does resist those kinds of uh, notes of, it, of notes of hope um, because the narrator leaves, but of course, like, I mean, what, all it says is that she's going to America, like nothing's gonna, like climate change exists everywhere. You can't escape it. Um, you can't escape any of, your, any of the problems that are facing you. Um, and yeah, I, I, I apologize. I feel like it's every time I've uh, tried to talk about it, I feel like a bit of a downer, but um, yeah, I don't, I, I can't, I can't, um, I can't fulfill the obligatory note of hope quota. Um, well, I, I mean, I grapple with that, you know, <laughs> all the time. I don't think anyone's ever, you know, accused me of providing the obligatory note of hope. Um, but, you know, 
with the nonfiction book where you're pointing out a huge problem, you know, the traditional sort of payoff for having made your way through the book is to be offered this the solution to the problem. That's just um, sort of the way things are. And, you know, I'd say nine, maybe nine times, 9.5 times out of 10, people feel they need to deliver that. And, you know, many very good books, um, you know, begin with a very, very, you know, smart and compelling description of the problem, which is a lot more compelling than the solution because the solution is a lot, a lot harder describing the solution than describing the problem. I wrote, you know, my last book, um, The Six Extinction, the last chapter was called The Thing with Feathers, which was, you know, really playing around, um, sort of joking around, to be really frank, with this sort of trope, you know, that we're going to end with something hopeful. Now, some people chose to uh, interpret that as hope. The thing with feathers was actually, you know, a bird, one of the last of his kind. If you see that as hopeful, you know, so be it, you know, fine. <laughs> but it was really um, pretty explicitly, you know, playing around with that idea. Do you end on a hopeful note or not? Uh, or do you dispense with that? Um, and this, current book, which, you know, lays out a lot of, builds to these pretty grandiose schemes people have for, for salvation, you know, by some um, accounts, you know, uh, they would, pro pro these technologies would provide a kind of fix for climate change, um, which otherwise, you know, is really geophysically very, very, very difficult. <laughs> um, but once again, it leaves you with the question, well, you know, how you want to look at them, if you want to see them as hopeful, or if you want to see them as initiate, you know, as, as actually, you know, a horror movie, um, you know, that's, that's kind of up to you. Um, so also, I was similarly trying to not end on, I mean, I wasn't, didn't want to, don't end on the note of, well, you know, abandon hope ye who enter here, but I also certainly don't end on the note of, Oh, it, here's my 10 point plan for fixing, you know, climate change or anything else. <laughs> um, but I do think that is a tremendous problem in the world of even just talking, even just having any kind of um, uh, frank, even political conversation. You know, what are we, what are we talking about? We're, we're really talking about you know, trying to avoid the worst possible outcomes. That's actually what we're talking about now. Um, that's not a very, that's not a rallying cry. Let's avoid the worst possible outcome. It's hard to get people to rally behind that banner. Well, and I think, I mean, part of what strikes me in hearing both of you talk about the kind of um, dangers of, on the one hand, the dangers of false consolation or the kind of hollowness of the obligatory note of hope, and maybe on the other hand, the dangers of presenting despair in a way that is so overwhelming that it also becomes paralyzing or almost a kind of, um, uh, uh, what's the, that kind of invites people almost away from action, that is there's sort of a danger on both sides. And, and there are a number of, um, there are a number of questions that are sort of geared towards, and I'm gonna to try to link a few of them together maybe, but a number of questions that are sort of geared towards this question of like how, how to, um, what sorts of effects you want your books to have on readers maybe in a number of senses, but in terms of maybe counteracting a sense of of paralysis um, and and inviting them to engage with this rather than uh, either shutting down through complacency or maybe shutting down through despair um, so Rachel asks um, uh, how do we invite how do we write that human scale as they's talking about in a way that invites readers in rather than perpetuating the overwhelming despair that dissuades people from engaging altogether in this topic um, and maybe on a more personal note how do both of you sort of stay grounded enough to keep to keep writing or how do people writing about climate crisis kind of um, maybe survive the despair of writing it there's a, a 
a kind of a, a really poignant question later on from, from Sandy, how do you manage knowing what you know that I think is, is connected to that question. Um, and then um, a question from um, Juhaya, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but uh, what are your goals in terms of readers' reactions? What do you hope to make them feel emotionally and to change their perspectives and or behaviors? There are a few directions there, but I'll just <laughs> felt connected to me around um, around around impact and kind of surviving the overwhelm of of, of how hard all this is to face. Well, I'll, I'll take a quick stab at that. I mean, I I tried in this latest book, really. It it's sort of a I hope a, you know a, it's a dark comedy. I mean, it's not a um, it's hoping to sort of get around the problem of, of, of addressing this problem directly with, you know, it's not a litany of, um, of the problems that that section that I, I read is the closest that we get to that. Um, and, and it's not a, a set of, of, of um, it, it, it's pretty, it's weirdly, um, Maybe weirdly, I don't know. I mean, it's 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 meant to be a bit of a romp, to be honest, um, which sounds weird when you're talking about climate change um, and you know all sorts of other ecological disasters too thrown in, to be honest. But I thought or hoped or that you know tonally, um, you know, there's just a, a sort of a sameness to a lot of of you know writing on climate change, unfortunately, is from the nonfiction perspective, I feel, and this, I, this is not meant to be you know, critical. There's, there's a lot of great books and great books are being written all the time, but you know, they do hit you over the head and people don't necessarily particularly want to be hit over the head. And I, as a reader, don't particularly want to be hit over the head. So a fiction writer has many more sort of avenues, I think. And I, you know, I'm somewhat, as a nonfiction writer, somewhat jealous of that but what a nonfiction writer has is you know you can you can go at things from different angles and so uh, in this particular experiment and I would say it is sort of an experiment um, it, it, it is to kind of um, try to the tone and the subject are cross purposes and that is um, an effort to sort of get around that problem that it's just so heavy duty and so debilitating. Now, what do I hope people will get out of it? In that sense, I, as a journalist, I somewhat hide behind that old, you know, very old fashioned notion, you, you do with it what you will. You know, you, you take this information and if you decide that, you, that this, you know, you wanna crawl under the bed, so be it. And if you decide you wanna to take to the street, so be it. But I can't control that. Um, and I didn't set out to write it to get you to do something. And I also didn't set out to write it to get you not to do something. You know, that, that's sort of not exactly my, my role. Yeah, I, I agree certainly with the, um, with the statement that it's not my role to get you to do something. Um, it's funny, I do think fiction, uh, has a lot of um, leeway to play around with, a, like with the representation of climate change. Um, but as you were saying it, I, I remembered, or um, a lot of a lot of what I was interested in in terms of uh, talking about nature, writing about climate change. I didn't set out to write a book about climate change. It just kind of became they became the fabric of it um, because I, I write a lot about place and a lot about land and you can't talk about place or land right now without talking about the changing climate, especially not in Australia. Um, and when I looked at what climate change writing is considered to be, uh, particularly like with fiction, it's all, it's nearly always like cli-fi. It's, it's um, dystopian, it's near future. It's, what hap it's what's happened when the floods already flooded the city um, and it's already happened. And so what I was doing uh, and what I really wanted to do um, all through the book is every time that a, a natural disaster is depicted in the novel, um, for instance, there's like a, there's a flood that is, um, that's recounted, which I think is the most fun I had uh, writing the book, which is very morbid. Um, 
I made sure that every single detail, the book is set in 2013, every single detail about those um, natural disasters or any kind of climactic event is completely non-fictional. I just slew, I spent a lot of time in newspaper archives. Um, and it meant that I, but it meant that like with that particular flood, I could pick and choose details. The flood is not necessarily remembered that much in Australia. It was just like a regular old flood that happens in Australia. But um, it was, you know, worsened by all of the things that are, that are worsening from climate change. Um, it meant that I could skew it surreal. Um, and I, I enjoy doing that a lot of the time. Um, it felt, whether, whether that like kept me going, um, whether it meant that I, I, I wasn't trying to, um, I didn't want anyone to come away from the book feeling like this was any, any sort of conversation about climate change was something that was going to happen in the future that wasn't affecting them right now, that it is happening right now. And in the most surreal moments where you encounter the uncanny, where you encounter like the weird animal at the beach that's not meant to be there, or the snow that's happening at a weird time, or the heat that's happening at a weird time, all of those things are, they're part of the fabric of your everyday, but it's also the part of the fabric of your everyday life where like you're having a bad breakup and like you, you know, you're not sure what you're going to eat for dinner. Um, it, it, it really like is affecting us on a micro level. And that was something that um, I was hoping, I, I talked about um, being a mirror before and I was sort of hoping to do that. Um, in terms of what I wanted people to take away from it, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think, um, I guess you don't write out, you don't start off writing a novel with, um, or at least I didn't start off writing a novel with an idea of here is what I want it to be, here is like the kind of uh, thesis statement for it, or what I thought it was at the beginning is very different to how it is at the end. Um, so I hope, I mean, I hope it's not deeply depressing and I hope it's not um, completely, you know, like completely without consolation. Um, I find a lot of consolation in uh, in books that don't have a sort of like skew differently, um, that have notes of the surreal and things like that. Um, but I mean, it's it's difficult. I, it's it's I'm st I'm still writing about climate change uh, and nature now, and it doesn't. Um, you don't feel any better about it. Well, and I think you know it's so it's so. Um, I was thinking about the the what you were saying about kind of purposefully turning away from or or writing a book that was not cli-fi but was so rooted in just a, a year that every detail was not drawn from some dystopian near future it was drawn from the, what we have already lived through and that that was this important dimension of the book that it sort of um in a way have the feeling of something dystopian but be in, entirely grounded in what is now and, and it made me think about a particular image actually from your book let's say at one point um you're showing a photograph of um all the asian carp jumping up out of the water and it actually does kind of look like something from sci fi i mean maybe not to somebody who's well versed in youtube videos of, of asian carp acrobatics but um there's like there's a there's a surrealness that that appears in both of these books but it's constantly challenging us because it's it's not something you can push away as surreal or as a as something removed from our reality it actually is our reality um and i wonder there's a question um that for you madeline that i'll pose just because it's so directly connected to what you were just saying about not setting out in a way to write a you know a book about any kind of with any kind of um, particular argument or thesis statement but but realizing part way through and you were talking about engaging with the Goshen and, and how that was part of this kind of um pivoting that the book took but um there's a question um, from Michelle um, who, who asks you, Madeline, can you talk more about the process of changing the direction of the book by orienting the story around climate change? What was it about before and did you completely restructure the book or go back and add change things within the existing structure? Which in a way is also a kind of question about, you know, how to think about not climate change as a subject separate from our lives, but would be already integrated into them or part of them, but how did you sort of find a narrative shape that could acknowledge that or, or illuminate it? Uh, it, was a, it was a hard and difficult process. Um, I Originally I set out, I thought I was writing about women, I was thought I was writing specifically about a kind of um, generations of women in Australia. Um, and 
that was that was about as specific as it got. And I got through a, um, a draft of the novel, um, and then and and it and it didn't work. Um, it it didn't work as a novel, and I didn't really know how it was going to work. Um, but that was sort of mid twenty seventeen. It was the summer of twenty seventeen. Um, and I took a few months off from it. I went to, uh, and I um, was in California for a while. Um, and uh, a lot of, a lot of the kind of um, thinking about climate change, uh, or thinking about nature, actually, I shouldn't just say climate change, but um, that I found most affecting and uh, like has most influenced me has been specifically about California, um, whether that's John Muir or Mary Austin or whether it is um, Mike Davis. So what happened was I went to California and I found this uh, out of print book by Mike Davis called Ecology of Fear. Um, and I started reading at a bookstore in LA and I, and I, and I realized that I needed to change the structure entirely. It was also um, that summer was uh, the summer that um, it seemed like uh, nuclear warheads were gonna come across from North Korea at any moment. So I was filled with dread at all, at all times. And I realized I was always at a sort of peak of, um, a peak of intensity so uh, then I went back to the novel and I wanted, to, I basically wanted to sort of take all of that stuff um, and use, use that level of intensity that um, there's, a, there's a line in the book about um, living in the, in the continuous present tense. Um, you never, you know, there's never a moment to reflect in the book. Um, the narrator doesn't ever, the, the narrator never reflects. Um, she's, she's constantly like just a vehicle for emotion and she has very poor boundaries with anything, whether that's nature or with other people. Um, uh, so I printed the novel out and I cut it out with scissors, uh, paragraph by paragraph, and I rearranged it on the carpet. Um, and it, that I did that twice, uh, before I figured out that it needed to be, uh, in seasons. Um, it was originally over a couple of years. I made it just 2013. Um, I changed a lot of the things that didn't used to happen in 2013. Um, it meant that I was really all over all of the weather that happened everywhere in Australia in 2013. Um, and then I um, thought about the, the kind of like the progression of seasons, whether you go from summer to summer. Um, and the, it's not, uh, the book doesn't go through winter, summer, spring, fall, uh, because Australia has a, at least like the Southeast coast of Australia, um, like Southern California has a Mediterranean climate um, that doesn't really apply. So it goes from heat to flood to, um, to fire at the end. And that was how I found the structure. And once I found the structure, the structure, the structure mirrored what the book was already about. But once I had that in place, um, I could finally rewrite it uh, knowing, knowing what it was. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's there's a question that I want to ask um, uh, Betsy that's sort of connected to this question of of maybe structuring and restructuring. Um, although it's really it's I mean on a craft level it's fascinating to hear you talk about that part of the process. And um, there's a there's a question for you, Betsy, and 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 I know that we're we're reaching the end of our time. There are some wonderful questions here that we're not going to be able to get to you um, but I think it's a sign of how much people are taking from from everything you guys are talking about um uh there's a question for you Betsy from um from Paige uh I'm looking for it um and I think it's also maybe a nice way to kind of give a sense of how much your book is doing um and I want to connect it with a, a another question that's following up on something you just said but but Paige's question is a, is a question about structure and selection and the composition of the book um Betsy you say you could have chosen so many other stories to illustrate the points in your book what led you to pick uh these ones um so that's a sort of part one of the question and then um part two comes from Anna um, who's sort of following up on what you said about, um, uh, she says, um, following on that note of what a journalist or writer's role is in the context of the climate crisis, if the role is not about getting a reader to do or not do something, how would you describe your role? So to me, those feel connected, like why and how did you choose the particular stories that you chose? And then sort of what do you understand your role as a writer to be in terms of, of, of what you want those stories to be doing in the book that you create? Well, the, the process for, you know, choosing the stories, I wish I could say there was a, something very methodical or, or scientific about it. You know, it, it, it 
had a lot of elements of serendipity. There were certain points that I knew I wanted to illustrate. You know, I wanted to talk about gene editing, for example, which is very cutting edge um, question of, you know, are, are we gonna now muck around with things on the level of, of the genome? Very, very current question because of CRISPR. And that actually uh, took me to Australia <laughs> where, um, you know, because Australia, you know, we haven't even gotten to one of the inter many interesting aspects of Australia, which is that it's, you know, sort of the extinction capital of the world, um, because it's certainly the mammalian extinction capital of the world, because it's the, you know, colonists brought over these, this whole European fauna that rabbits and foxes and cats, which have, um, just devastated Australia's native mammals and um, cane toads, those were brought later. Um, and so, you know, I knew there were certain um, t technologies, certain ideas that I wanted to address in the book. And I went sort of looking for exemplary stories. So, you know, for example, I went to Australia to talk to people who were ed gene editing cane toads in the hopes that they these are these very poisonous toads that have taken over much of the Australian countryside are still on the move. Um, and it just seemed like a very vivid story. There are a million examples you could have of gene editing, but this seemed like sort of a fun story that also raised some interesting questions. Like what about gene editing to save a species? How, is that okay? You know, people might've read about um, this black-footed ferret that was just created from, from frozen, for it was cloned basically. It was a big, pretty big story in the wildlife biology world uh, just two days ago or so, a cloned ferret. Um, and I, I don't have time to go into the details of why this is an amazing story, but trust me, it's an amazing story. It's an amazing, uh, you know, leap forward for trying to save this species, which was down to seven or eight or nine individuals, some crazily small number. Um, it was created from tissue that had been frozen of a, of a dead ferret. Um, and, you know, are we gonna move into that sort of brave frontier? You know, so, so, so all of which is to say there were just, you know, question issues that I wanted to um, address and went looking for the stories that seemed to address them, but it could have been a whole other set of stories addressing the same uh, issues. And as for the question of what you know, I want to do, which I can only answer, you know, for myself, I still do once again. And, it, you know, you could say it's a, you know, it's a cop out, but I, I do believe that information matters and, you know, true information matters and should elicit a response. So I guess if I say, well, I don't, you know, I'm not asking you to do something. I am not asking you to do anything in particular, but I am asking you to wake up you know, um, and so I guess I do see the role of journalism as shining a light on things that we, people might prefer, you know, not to think about. Um, and how you get, especially in the context of a book, I mean, I also write mostly for magazines and when the magazine arrives, people either read it or don't, but I don't have to worry whether you picked up the magazine, that's the subscriptions department's problem. You know? <laughs> but a book, you have to get into people's hands and you have to figure out, try to figure out a way to get them to read it. And that is the challenge, you know? Yeah, I love that idea of, um, of, of kind of asking people to wake up as, as, as part of the call. Uh, I, well, it's our time is done. Uh, this is such, has been such a rich conversation. There's so much more to say, uh, but you know, you bring up a good point about books. So I guess we can end by saying, please buy these books and continue uh, thinking about these things now that you've had this conversation. We will post a video of this on the Center for Fiction's website so that you can uh, share it with friends and 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 continue the conversation after this. Um, thank you, Leslie, for uh, for moderating this great conversation. Madeline and um, Elizabeth Betsy, thank you both so much. Um, I wish uh, you every success with your books, 
And um, Madeline, I hope you get back to New York <laughs> soon. <laughs> Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Madeline and Betsy. This was wonderful. Thank you, Leslie.